Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a review of Something Happened by Joseph Heller. Um, I'm going to read you the blurb, and then I'm going to go check out some of my tabs before I share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. Sorry, the reason I just had a little chuckle there is because at the start of all of my videos, I like say what the video is so that when I'm getting the footage off my camera, I don't have to skip through to see what I'm talking about. And I introduced this by saying Casey, because I'm currently reading... I'm not even reading Ken Casey, I'm reading a book about Ken Casey. But anyway, <laughs> blurb. Dane reads... Bob Slocum is a promising executive. He has an attractive wife, three children, a nice house, and as many mistresses as he desires. His life is settled, he has conformed. Society demands, therefore, that he should be happy, or at least pretend to be. But the pretense is becoming more and more difficult as desolation, frustration, and fear take over. It was the madness of war that inspired the magnificent lunacy of Catch-22. It is the malaise of modern America which prompts this brilliant novel, a book as splendidly unique as its predecessor. Now, confession time, I've not read Catch-22. I do have it on my TBR, so I'll get to it soon. Um, but I did read an excerpt of this as part of the Penguin Mini Moderns box set, and I really enjoyed it, so I wanted to get to this one as a priority. And spoiler alert, I did really enjoy this as well. So, I'm gonna go through and check out some of my tabs, and then I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. So I want to read out this, uh, basically it's the opening three paragraphs or the opening two pages, but there's a lot here I think that's uh, worth sharing. It's actually not the opener because um, there are different sections to this. So the first section is uh, I get the willies, um, which I didn't have anything out of, and then this is the office in which I work. And I think this was, the stuff about the office was what I took away most from this. Um, I, and I think it'll be very relatable to anyone who's ever worked in an office. In the office in which I work, there are five people of whom I am afraid. Each of these five people is afraid of four people, excluding overlaps, for a total of 20. And each of these 20 people is afraid of six people, making a total of 120 people who are feared by at least one person. Each of these 120 people is afraid of the other 119. And all of these 145 people are afraid of the 12 men at the top who helped found and build the company and now own and direct it. All these 12 men are elderly now and drained by time and success of energy and ambition. Many have spent their whole lives here. They seem friendly, slow and content when I come upon them in the halls. They seem dead and are always courteous and mute when they ride with others in the public elevators. They no longer work hard. They hold meetings, make promotions and allow their names to be used on announcements that are prepared and issued by somebody else. Nobody is sure anymore who really runs the company, not even the people who are credited with running it. But the company does run. Sometimes these 12 men at the top work for the government for a little while. They don't seem interested in doing much more. Two of them know what I do and recognise me because I have helped them in the past and they have been kind enough to remember me, although not, I'm sure, by name. They inevitably smile when they see me and say, how are you? I inevitably nod and respond, fine. Since I have little contact with these 12 men at the top and see them seldom, I am not really afraid of them. But most of the people I am afraid of in the company are. Just about everybody in the company is afraid of somebody else in the company, and I sometimes think I'm a cowering boy back in the automobile casualty insurance company for which I used to work very long ago, sorting and filing automobile accident reports after Mrs. Jurger was placed in charge of the file room and kept threatening daily to fire us all. She was a positive, large woman of overbearing confidence and nasty amiability who never doubted the wisdom of her biases. A witty older girl named Virginia sat under a big Western Union clock in that office and traded dirty jokes with me. My name's Virginia. Virginia for short, but not for long, haha. <laughs> she was peppy and direct, always laughing and teasing, with me anyway. And I was too young and dumb then to see that she wasn't just joking. Good God, she used to ask me to get a room for us somewhere, and I didn't even know how. She was extremely pretty, I think now, although I'm not sure I thought so then, but I did like her, and she got me hot. Her father had killed herself a few years before. Much went on there in that company too that I didn't know about. Virginia herself had told me that one of the married claims adjusters had taken her out in his car one night, turned insistent, and threatened to rape her or put her out near a cemetery until she pretended to start to cry. I was afraid to open doors in that company too, I remember, even when I had been sent for by one of the lawyers or adjusters to bring in an important file or a sandwich. I was never sure whether to knock or walk right in, to tap deferentially or rap loudly enough to be heard at once and command admission. Either way, I would often encounter expressions of annoyance and impatience, or feel I did. I had arrived too soon or arrived too late. One thing um, that that excerpt highlighted as well, um, Hella uses a lot of um, parentheses in this. So like, he'll be doing a sentence and in the middle of it, he'll just go off on a tangent. Um, and uh, you know, there'll be like three or four paragraphs within parentheses, um, but it worked. And um, 
Another great excerpt here, this final quote as well in particular. So he says, There was a girl in that company too who went crazy while I was there. She was filed away. And in the company I worked for before this one, there was a man, a middle minor executive, who went crazy and jumped out of a hotel window and killed himself. He left a note saying he was sorry he was jumping out of the hotel window and killing himself, that he would have shot himself instead, but he didn't know how to obtain a gun or use one. He was picked up off the ground by the police, probably, and filed away. I think that maybe in every company today, there is always at least one person who is going crazy slowly. And here, talking about women, because again, he's a bit of a chauvinist and sort of sleeping with everybody, like repeatedly cheating on his wife. And he says, um, I don't really know how I'm supposed to feel. I do know that girls in their early 20s are easy and sweet. Girls in their late 20s are easier, but sad, and that isn't so sweet. They are easy, I think, because they are sweet. And they are sweet, I think, because they are dumb. This was an interesting little paragraph as well. I mean, I think with most of this book, it's the it's seen inside um, Slocum's head, which I found most interesting. He's not the most likable of characters, but oddly, it's the unlikable characters that I tend to like, because I think they tend to be more interesting. So he says, I'm simply not able to stop myself from saying things to her I know I shouldn't. Sometimes the words escape from me before I can consider them, before I'm even aware they have sprung from my mind and are being shaped by my mouth and tongue to fly out between my lips. And I hear my blunt or cutting remarks with a sort of astonishment, as though they came from somebody else and were directed harmfully at me as well as her, as though they had their source in some dark and frightening area of my soul with which I am not in communication. It is that same weird, perverse, glowering part of me that shelters my recurring impulse to kick Cagle's lame leg very hard, and to kick my daughter's leg under the table or strike her. I am never really tempted to hit my wife or my boy, and I never have. I don't think I have. I have never hit my daughter either, or kicked her. And it nourishes refreshingly that thrilling desire of mine to say very cruel things to people I like who are in trouble and confide in me and request my sympathy or help. I do rejoice momentarily in the misfortunes of friends. I cannot condone their weakness. I cannot forgive them for being in need. I experience undeniable gladness that I enjoy suppressing. I like finding out I'm better off than someone else. There are things going on inside me I cannot control and do not admire. And I think those are like very human impulses. I mean, I know I certainly sometimes have thoughts and things like that. And I would just get the great line. He's, he's saying like, I wish, I wish, I wish I knew what to wish. And he talks about how um, sometimes his wife has bad dreams and he'll wake her up unless he's annoyed with her, in which case he'll leave her to have the bad dreams. You get this little bit of dialogue here. Uh, She's my daughter. I can't say I love you to my own daughter. Why not? It sounds like incest, only to you. She thinks you're disappointed in her. But part of this is because like she'll go around wearing hardly any clothes and he's like, she's developed. It's like really uncomfortable for me. And we get this interesting little paragraph. Uh, a vacuum cleaner that works well is more important to me than the atom bomb. And it makes not the slightest difference to anyone I know that the earth revolves around the sun instead of vice versa, or the moon around the earth. Although the measured ebb and flow of the tides may be of some interest to mariners and clam diggers, but who cares about them? Green is more important to me than God. So for that matter is Cagle and the man who handles my dry cleaning. And a transistor radio that is playing too loud is a larger catastrophe to me than the next Mexican earthquake. Someday, it must have crossed my mother's mind at least once after my denial and rejection of her since she was only human. This will happen to you. Although she was too generous to me to ever say so, but I think it must have crossed her mind. Because his mum basically had like Alzheimer's. I think it was Alzheimer's. We get a reference to um, how far is the horizon? 18 miles at sea level, I answer rapidly. Or only 14, I forget which. Why sea level? I don't know, maybe if you're up higher you can see farther. 18 and even 14 miles sounds like a long way for the horizon. Maybe if there are no buildings, but I mean, I live in the UK, mate. Like 18 miles from here is almost to London. I can't see London, I can't see out of town. He says here, I'm so afraid that I will start talking to myself someday that I feel I already do. People will make fun of me or look the other way and pretend I'm not. I suffer chest pains frequently because I'm so afraid of suffering chest pains someday and dying of a heart attack. My brother died of a heart attack while waiting for something in the waiting room of his office. And my father died of something else while I was just a little boy. And my mother, as I can't forget, was struck down in her old age by a number, some of them too subtle and minute in an individual effect to be counted, of cerebral vascular accidents, as they are euphemistically called. They did not seem like accidents. That set her tongue clattering inside her mouth when she tried to talk and turned the rest of her, eventually, to bloodless pulp. So part of my anxiety, I have quite bad health anxiety, and when I get you know, a racing heart and a racing pulse, I get worried that I have a heart attack. It's a very unpleasant feeling. We get here talking about his son, he says, uh, he probably will not want to swim nude. I know I didn't. If he is like so many of the rest of us, he will think that his cock is small and in danger of vanishing. We get a little joke here. Did you hear about the homosexual astronauts? Yes, they went to Uranus. Probably not politically correct these days. We get this line. He is afraid of the government, the army, the Pentagon, the police. And so am I. 
I think it's probably healthy to be afraid of them. And I'm just going to read this little excerpt out here, some of the things he worries about. He's talking about his son. I identify with him too closely, I think, and remember that once, when he was still an infant in diapers, kicking his legs away as he lay on the bathinet, rocking it perilously and raising a violent clatter and spray of powder cans and safety pins. My wife yelled to me urgently to come into the room and showed me a fiery red blotch on the side of the head of his penis. It must have been minuscule, had to be, but appeared a gigantic blister at the time. And I doubled over with a keen slicing pain in my own penis the instant I saw the rough, small, flaming red patch and cut my hands over all my genitals reflexively to preserve and soothe them. It hurt then. It hurts now when I remember. Oh, that's why I wanted to read this as well. There's a printing error. Two of the sentences are in the wrong order. So he says, I don't have to look to make certain nothing's tip and saw a brown ant come crawling out, but I no longer there. Once when I was small, I felt a stinging itch at the tell this to anyone because nobody believes me. I guess I really do love this little thing of mine still, although I'm not sure why. Where would I be without it? And again, this I relate to because of my death anxiety. He says, I think about death. I think about it all the time. I dwell on it. I dread it. I don't really like it. Death runs in my family, it seems. People die from it, and I dream about death and weave ornate fantasies about death endlessly and ironically. And I find, God help me, that I still do want to make that three minute speech. I really do yearn to be promoted to Cagle's job. Last night in bed, I stopped dwelling on death for a while and began formulating plans for either of the two speeches I might be asked to make. I might be asked to make none. I found good phrases for both. Last night in bed after fashioning my good phrases, or was it early this morning while journeying back uncrippled again from sleep? I dreamed that our maid called me at the office while my wife was out drinking somewhere or screwing somewhere. I have dreams about that too lately every once in a while and I don't like them at all and told me in a slurred southern accent with a voice as deep as a coloured man's, Mr. Your boy is lying on the floor of the living room and hasn't breathed for 15 seconds. Someone says, I see, said the blind man, which is something that my mum used to say to me all the time when I was younger. And we get a great quote here because the guy's, he's not really into golf, but he plays it anyway for like his social life, uh, the workplace. And uh, he says, I don't know what else one can do with a hole in one except talk about it. And then he's talking about his wife here and he says, she drinks too much at some parties and not enough at others. She's stiff and uncomfortable and makes other people that way. She gives off clouds of social uneasiness at company affairs the way other people give off smell. And apologies for the use of the R word for somebody with like, you know, brain damage, etc. Uh, this is, I'm just reading out from the book, you know. Um, but it is important because it kind of relates back to his child um, and he says, um, it's part of my strategy. You wouldn't be able to handle this job if they decide to give me Kegels. I could, I could do it better than him. I might be able to make vice president that way. Kegels not. Kegel limps and has hair in his nose and ears. Nobody with a limp or a retarded child is ever going to be president. Roosevelt limped. I mean of the company. The company is more particular than the country. And a big long old section I want to read here about fetishes. This is very long. Uh, this is a good example of how long some of the paragraphs are in this book. And I have no compelling fetishes, although certain silken undergarments get me hot and are more attractive to me than the parts they cover. Big tits in bras and jersey can get me hot. Small ones make me romantic. Small asses on slim girls are starting to draw appreciating gazes from me. Many of these are on very young girls and this is something new. The only woman I've ever wanted to beat up was my wife and that, to my shame, was over money. She insinuates I'd give too little but won't take more. I felt most content as I watched her dress to leave, lofty. She looked comical and naive, stuffed into flowered bikini underpants. I thought a moment of flipping her over my knees and paddling her smooth muscular bottom, but remembered she'd be heavy. That's the trouble with so many of our damn picturesque sex fantasies. They hurt. I've pampered myself before with the temptation of spanking a nice ass someday, but never got one beautiful enough. Maybe there are no beautiful ones outside of magazines. I'm in love with a four color magazine page. She still smiled. I was sorry for her in a patronizing, uncommitted way. I wonder what happens to squat, homely, black and Puerto Rican whores with one missing molar when they grow too old. Who takes care of them? And ugly to attract handsome, pinstripe libertines like me. I know what happens. They attract me anyway if I'm alone in New Orleans where everyone else seems to be having a good time. I ought to know by now that hardly anyone over the age of four ever has a good time anymore. Women do at weddings and movies. It was a waste. The hundred dollar beauty in San Francisco was a waste. She didn't look like an aristocrat once I had her. She looked like a skinny girl in need of sunshine or more red corpuscules. I'm glad I never had to see either of them again. I wonder what happens to homely white whores when they grow older and lose their figures and lose their teeth. They become public drunkards with gravelly masculine voices who quarrel with each other loudly on sidewalks in warm weather. I still had all my newspapers after my little black beauty left, thank God. And I ate three sticky candy bars and drank two cans of soda from a vending machine in the hall as I read them. I would have felt self-conscious going down into the lobby again that night. I went to sleep with caramel and nut crumbs in my mouth. 
I had what might have been the start of a homosexual dream, stopped it in time, and switched reels into the middle of a different dream I barely remembered, in which I was a failing history student at the University of Bologna trying to find my way out of the yellow rock tangle of school buildings, in time to catch a plane back home to my wife. There was a hatchet-faced, bleached, blonde, scrawny actress I was trying to flee who kept sliding along the opposite side of the stone walls in stealthy pursuit. She carried an icon of some kind, cradling her hands that were smaller than herself and could have been a human figure carved out of a penis, feces, or a stick of African sculpture. I seemed able to identify all and wanted none, and that's why I was running from her. Her face was Horace White's. The next day I worried intermittently on the plane going back about carrying syphilis, gonorrhea or crabs home to my wife from New Orleans. In the dream I was failing in Bologna because I had been unable to find my way to any of the classrooms all year, although I had tried repeatedly. I itched, I scratched, I always itch afterward. Guilefully I would deny to my wife I'd even had it and accuse her of having given it to me. Both statements could not be true of course, but she would be intimidated by my yelling and unable to grasp that, and I would yell in sanctimonious outrage and convince her. There are no convenient army prophylactic stations around anymore, dispensing soapy absolution by the pint for our sins of the flesh. They're gone too. So is sin. Most of my favourite restaurants are closing. There is only crime. I often don't enjoy it. My climaxes often aren't. Other times there's this gigantic spurting leap. The difference is me. It's got nothing to do with them. They all do pretty much the same things by now. So do we. Sometimes it really dances. Other times it only stirs as much as necessary to get the ridiculous ritual over with. In Italy after the war, girls from Bologna stated they were the best in all Europe and wheedled for premium fees. They were no different from lower class girls in Naples and Rome. They did the same things. They were interchangeable. They still are. And this is just men being gross we get. A man came on her dress in the rush hour during the summer. She didn't know it until she was off the train and the fingers holding her pocketbook brushed against the sticky substance on the back of her hip. And here he's talking about his kids, he says. My daughter gets sore throats and stomach pains. My boy pleads tiredness and nausea and will sleep past noon some days if we let him. I use headaches, so does my wife. I've got chest pains I can draw upon, for everybody has great respect for a heart attack and a liver up my sleeve I can play in a clutch. My wife can counter with cancer scares and it's even Stephen down to the wire in the shadow of the Valley of Blue Cross major medical benefits. Wouldn't it be a laugh if my wife died of chest pains and I was the one who got cancer? When my wife is depressed and my daughter drops innuendos of suicide, I can plunge into thick sepulchral silences for days and feign such absorbed distraction that every remark to me has to be repeated. I can out ail any of them at anything but hysterectomies if I want to make the effort, any of them but Derek who begins with certain congenital handicaps that are impossible for me to overcome. Haha. <laughs> All of us boast of insomnia, not always truthfully. Were we taken at our word, not one member of the family has ever enjoyed a good night's sleep, except perhaps Derek who just can't bring himself to complain. Haha. <laughs> I wonder what's done with them in homes when they reach sexual maturity and discover they might just as well masturbate as do anything else. I'm glad he's not a girl. Castration's inhuman, so they cut off their arms. I wonder how they control attendance. How do they keep them away from the idiot boys and girls? My thoughts go haywire when I try to think of him. Tell me he'll not progress to a mental age past five, and I find myself thinking again if people at five know how to clean themselves properly after defecating. Of course not. My boy of nine still leaves stains on his undershorts, and so do I. So does everyone, probably, so why must I single out us? I see him now so lovely, touching and pitiful I can't bear to look. I see him next at 30, moving towards 60, and he is appalling. I am dazed, horrified, stricken dumb. Dark hair is growing on his face and on the backs of his hands, and his eyebrows are bushy. Will he look like me? He'll be balding. His suit won't fit. No one will groom him. His dandruff falls like fish scales. I colour his sweaters and jackets dark and his face pale. He is slack-jawed and flabby as they steer him about. He is repulsive, lame and monstrous. He still won't be able to speak. He will not know how to diet or play tennis, squash or golf, and his build and muscle tone will be sickly. He'll be ungainly. People would stare with hostility if he were anywhere else. They'll forget to clip his fingernails. People will want to kill him. They'll call him Benji. I will not want to visit him. I hope I can't remember him. I hope I don't find out my wife is committing adultery, even though she probably should. Get the great quote, dreams are merciless, they come upon you when you sleep. And then this observation on his daughter, obviously I don't agree with what he says here, but he says, I wish my daughter would stop leaving her bra around where I can see it and stop leaving her nightgown hanging on the door of the bathroom. She's developed fast and knows it. I see the way she dresses sometimes to go out and I'm furious. She has bigger breasts now than my wife. I can barely look at her as she pauses in front of me to wait for the money she says she needs. There isn't anything I can say that wouldn't be derogatory and crushing to her self-esteem at a moment when she might be feeling good about herself. I wish she'd always wear her bra instead of leaving it tossed around. She'll wear blue denim jeans and doesn't always look clean. She reminds me of Ann Arbor. Every girl I meet these days reminds me of a different one I've known. No wonder they say dirty things to you when you walk past. You're asking for it. If you get raped, you deserve it. 
Jesus, Bob. And his daughter says, I think I love money more than anything else in the world. I love it more than ice cream. I would never give it away, my daughter asserts self-righteously. I don't think, daughter dear, that you ever have. <laughs> money makes the world go round, young man, and money makes history too. How come? You take history, don't you? It's called social studies. Money makes social studies. Without money, there would be no social studies. How come? What dad means, explains my daughter, is that the love of money and the quest for gold and riches in the past is what caused most of the events we read about today in all our history books. Right, dad? Right, indeed, my darling daughter. It's very true. And he used to um, ring hospitals to inquire about the condition of people that he knew had died. And we get this amusing little line. It wasn't so bad living in my old man's scrotum, as far as I can recall. It was warm and humid, and there was lots of companionship. I had a ball. That was a good one. And then he gets his promotion and we get, uh, there's one more thing we found out about Cagle Bob, Arthur Barron tells me. He goes to prostitutes in the afternoon. I've gone with him. You'll stop though, won't you? I already have. That's good, Bob. I was sure you would. By the way, he adds, pressing my elbow with a conspiratorial wink and chuckling. They're much better in the evening. So yeah, Something Happened by Joseph Heller. I think it's just a really interesting study of the human condition. It's very like, it covers like very mundane stuff. Uh, this guy's life and his work and the politics of work. Um, but I think it's something we can all relate to. It's also interesting because he's not a particularly good guy, but he, it's kind of Keller saying this is what people are like, take it or leave it, you know? Um, and I just found Bob Slocum to be a very compelling character to read about. So Something Happened by Joseph Heller. Really enjoyed. Five out of five for me, and it's in the uh, running for one of my top books of the year. So there we have it. That's what I made of Something Happened by Joseph Heller. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments if you've read this book, and if so, what you thought of it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more, and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.